Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, February 7th, 2017 edition of the Sand Center and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Readers often send us files and then ask, well, is this file malicious or not? And we really enjoy it if uh, people send it to us, but often there isn't an easy solution to figure out if something is malicious or not, in particular if it's not malicious. Typically, it's relatively easy to figure out it's ransomware or something obviously malicious, but uh, then there are a lot of sort of border cases like spyware, adware, that may be considered malicious by some people but not so malicious by other people and I have an interesting example here that the reader submitted earlier today that actually turns out to be pretty certainly non-malicious. It's part of a Chinese office suite that apparently gets pre-installed on some HP laptops. But uh, for example, Avast still decided to label this file as possibly malicious. And if you do sort of a quick automatic uh, reverse engineering on the file, it turns out that it does send data to a remote site. Well, that's what a lot of Office Suites do. It also is able to download additional components, of course, for auto update and the like. And it does have access to, for example, your browser history. All of this uh, is considered often malicious behavior, but in this case, it's also in line with what an Office Suite typically does as it interacts uh, with uh, the network and uh, with uh, the browser. I have links to some of the analysis results in the diary. So if you want to check yourself how you would characterize the file, take a look. And in vulnerabilities today, we have two remote denial of service attacks against the OpenBSD HTTP server. A little bit disappointing here because uh, these are well-known denial of service conditions for HTTP servers. So they just hadn't been fixed yet for OpenBSD. The first one is an SSL renegotiation vulnerability that does consume high CPU load, uh, very common for OpenSSL and other libraries as well. So the second one affects, well, the range header. The range header has often caused issues when it comes to memory consumption. The range header in HTTP requests does essentially just request a partial document. And what has often happened, and that's what OpenBSD is doing here, that the entire document essentially loaded into memory and then just a particular piece is carved out and sent to the client. In this case, it also appears that the memory isn't completely freed after it is allocated. So this leads to a memory exhaustion. A security patch is available from OpenBSD and you're vulnerable if you're running the OpenBSD HTTP server up to version 6.0. If you're opening a DRM protected media file on Windows, there is an option where the creator of the file can include a copyright or a license message that then links to a website. Now, this feature has caused problems in the past and the latest issue here is that it could potentially be used to bypass the anonymity provided by the Tor browser. If you're downloading a media file using the Tor browser, browser and then click on the URL. Well, uh, you're actually no longer using the Tor browser. Instead, you're firing up in an explorer to download that particular file, which of course exposes your real IP address. In general, if you are relying on anonymity, Tor browser itself is a good start, but probably not quite sufficient because it only anonymizes requests being sent by the Tor browser you're probably better off using a Tor connection for all of your network traffic. And typically that requires that you use, for example, a Tor supported operating system like Tails. 
And one of the major operators of dark web or Tor based websites has been compromised and with that the around 2000 websites hosted by Freedom Hosting too. Now not only have the websites been defaced with a ransom message but also data hosted on these websites has been leaked. For example, 380,000 user emails from databases on these websites were made public. This is in particular significant because many of these websites, of course, dealt with illegal content and any user of these illegal websites may now be exposed by having their email address published. I haven't looked at the database myself, but according to Troy Hunt, who runs the I Have Been Pwned project, there are a number of government email addresses and the like in that list. So apparently people still haven't learned that if you do something that is a little bit suspicious, you probably should not use your work email. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.